Welcome. We're today going to talk about uh, Mosiah 11 through 17. And I'm going to start it out by talking about uh, the end of uh, Zenith. And uh, he decides to choose one of his sons to follow after him to be the king. And he chooses uh, King Noah. And King Noah apparently started out uh, following after his father, but very soon uh, started doing some very uh, things that both uh, Nephi and his father Lehi had been told that they could not practice polygamy. And King Noah starts choosing other wives and concubines and then taxing the people and getting rid of all of uh, uh, Zenith's uh, leaders in the community and then choosing his own, which followed after him, doing the things that he decided was most important. Yeah, so we've gone from a righteous king, a righteous high priest, prophet, leader, and a righteous council to a wicked high priest, king, prophet, and a wicked council. And if we look at the dates that they're showing here, this time frame of King Noah's reign until, until they kill Abinadi and Noah is also killed is about 12 years. So it's not even a super long time. We went from Zenith leading his people into battle in the strength of the Lord and teaching the gospel to King Noah, who is concubines and a wine bibber, and the people begin to follow. So they become idol worshipers. But we're talking to a group of people who are members of the Lord's church. They're covenant makers, right? So we're not talking about outside the church. We're talking about people who knew better and chose to do differently. Okay? So, Miranda, you had a couple things in here you had wanted to bring out. Yeah. So, as you, especially with chapter 11, when you read it, it makes you sad because yeah. you see just how far the people have fallen. Mm -hmm. Because in somewhere in 11, it talks about how the Lamanites come and attack. So Noah sends a little bit of his army and it's not enough and they get slaughtered. Yeah. So he sends even more and they drive the Lamanites out of their land. And the people come back and they're boasting and they're rejoicing in their spoil. And it talks how they've become a bloodthirsty people. Mm -hmm. And it just it makes you so sad watching going from the strength of the Lord and like the sadness that comes after the battle in the morning and then you come to this and they're delighting in it. Yeah, it's so strange how quickly it happened. And it, I think it's, to me, as I read that, to, it feels like a warning that it's so easy to slip. We can think when we're at this high and we're doing good that how could I ever do wrong? But what are we told? If you'll read in your Book of Mormon, specifically Book of Mormon, every day, really truly study in it, you will be strong and you'll be able to keep within your gospel covenants. But if you let that slip, then you begin this road and this path out and away. And that's really important. So what's happened here is obviously they stopped doing that. Okay, what else did you want to bring out in there? That's, that was it, I think. That was it in 11? Okay. So... It's a terrible, terrible time. And then we have a man come in, and we don't really know where Abinadi came from. We simply know that he was a righteous man who came to call the people to repentance. And the people hear it. He actually doesn't come before King Noah the first time. The people hear it, and they come to tell King Noah. And he it's like, says... It's like a tattletale, you know? He's like, do you know what he just said about you? <laughs> <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> And what's King Noah's reaction? Oh, he's so mad. He's so <laughs> mad. <laughs> Who is Abinadi that, what does he say? It's in verse 27 of 11. Yeah. Um, Who is Abinadi that I and my people should be judged of him? Here's the thing that, that makes me cringe. Who is the Lord? That. Ooh! Careful what you say, right? Who is the Lord that shall bring upon my people such great afflictions? Wow. They think they're invincible and can't be destroyed. That's, 
That's bad. That's really bad. Okay, so then we go into verse or chapter 12. And Abinadi, the first time he escapes out. And he tells them that they will be destroyed if they don't repent the first time. Second time he comes back. Joseph, how does he come back? He's disguised, but mm -hmm. the disguise is like more to get into the city where he can talk to people mm -hmm. more than, oh, I need to hide my face because I don't want to die. Yeah. So he's not trying to hide himself. True. So he's just trying to get in so he can teach them because now what? They haven't repented. They haven't repented. And he gives prophecies. You were bringing this out earlier, Emma, that some of those prophecies didn't happen in Abinadi's lifetime. What was Rinda? That was me. <laughs> not happened in his lifetime, didn't even happen sometimes in the children's lifetime. What were you saying about that? I, I was just, it was interesting because like the prophecies always come to pass, but specifically in verse eight, mm -hmm. it pretty much, well, it is the prophecy of the very end of the Nephite nation. Mm, yeah, that's true. 600 and so, years later almost. Yeah. We, like, I just thought it was interesting because we don't always know when it'll come to pass, but it will always come to pass. Yeah. And you yeah. can't put a timeline on what the Lord says. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It's in his timing. Yeah. If they're truly a prophet, and Abinadi is, then everything they say will come to pass in the Lord's time. You know, how many things from Isaiah haven't been fulfilled yet? <laughs> <laughs> Lots. How many things from Joseph Smith haven't been fulfilled yet? Things in the Doctrine and Covenants. A lot of things that haven't been fulfilled yet. Heber C. Kimball. I mean, some of his test, some of his testimony and prophecies of the last days. We haven't seen those things happen yet. And when they do come, they're going to be rough things. Because what does he say? Just like this people, this were these were the Lord's people, and they become wicked. And Heber C. Kimball said, well, actually, the Doctrine and Covenant says, "I will begin with my own house." When the Lord starts to clean things up, He doesn't start with the people who shouldn't know better. He starts with the people that should. He starts with people that should know better. I will begin with my own house. So that's, you know, when we see all of these things happening around us that are signs of the times, that are a sign that we need to repent. Because Joseph Smith was told, preach nothing but repentance unto this people. We as a people have to look at it and go, what are we doing? In what way have we become a part of the world? And Babylon, you know, that's the symbolic of the world that we need to repent of. How do we need to step out and be peculiar? Abinadi was peculiar. Yeah? It's very true. Yeah, we've got to be more like that. So in 12, he comes in and he tells them, and they capture him. They capture him. And King Noah is going to be destroyed if he doesn't bring his people, and he didn't. He didn't. So they capture him, they begin to question him, and he says to them, what do you teach this people? What do you teach them? They taught them the law of Moses, but, you know, he's just like, if you teach them the law of Moses, why don't you keep the law of Moses? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Why don't you uh, learn yeah. what if you teach it? Hypocrisy much? <laughs> <laughs> you teach, are you sure you know yeah. what you're teaching? <laughs> and actually, this totally parallels the time of the Savior, even. So, Abinadi is a type of Christ. Joseph Smith is a type of Christ. Things in their lives are very similar, almost completely parallel to the Savior. Really important to see those parallels because it helps us to understand the Savior better and how to follow him better. They were all killed. They were. They were eventually all killed. Um, and that's, that's part of that type of Christ, isn't it? So he is yeah. telling them, and he teaches them, so he teaches them the law of Moses. And yeah. they also ask him about the other scripture, how beautiful upon the fountain mountains are the feet of him that publisheth peace. Mm -hmm. So they, those are the two things they ask him about. And he, he goes through the Ten Commandments. So this week we have a good activity for you. We'll actually have you make some paper chains because Abinadi was put into bond, bounds, right? Bonds. And we're going to teach you how to memorize the Ten Commandments. And even a five-year-old can do it. So we're gonna, that'll be part of the activity stuff on the blog you'll want to look for part of how to remember the Ten Commandments. Because he goes through those and he teaches them. And he teaches them about Jesus Christ. Notice how deep the doctrine is. This is not a missionary discussion to non-members who don't know the gospel. They know it. They know the gospel. Right? So what is he doing when he's doing all of this? He's calling them to repentance. He's calling them to repentance. He's reminding them, you know this and this and this and this. Why aren't you living it? And he gives them Isaiah 53, which is totally 
about the Savior. And yet, I, it's so fascinating to me with these types of Christ. What were you going to say? Well, but we have to remember that, like, halfway through all this, Noah's like, this guy's insane. What are we to do with you? <laughs> right, right. And I'll get to that in a second. And I know I skipped over something you want to talk about. We'll get back to it. But it's fascinating to me how when I read this, and actually it makes us want to sing the Messiah, surely, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you can see how all the other types of Christ went through similar things. You can see Joseph Smith here. You can see Abinadi here. Yeah, because... All of those who follow the Savior and are persecuted and martyrs for him, especially those who are prophets, have some similarities between the Savior's prophecies in their lives. Abinadi was burned. Yeah. Joseph was martyred and the Savior was crucified. That's right. So they were all killed by someone. And they all died for the testimony. And don't forget Hiram. And Hiram. Hiram also gave his life for his testimony. Now, we skipped a little something in chapter 13 that we all love. So, Joseph talked about, for what are we to do with him? For he is mad. And then Catherine. Well, the king, he, he hears all these things. just like, he's mad. What are, we, what are we supposed to do with him? And just so uh, take him, slay him. And he says, touch me not. Just like that? I don't know. I don't know how he said it, but he says it. He says it. He says, How do you think he said it, Emma? (laughs) He says, Touch me not, for God shall smite you if you lay your hands upon me, for I have not delivered the message which the Lord has sent me to deliver. Neither have I told you that which ye requested that I should tell you. Mm -hmm. Therefore... God will not suffer that I should be destroyed at this time. That's right. He will not allow me to be destroyed at this time. And when I'm reading this, I can't help but think about the story of Joseph Smith and others of the brethren who were in Liberty Jail. And what are the guards doing? They are, I mean, he. there's one particular night with some really bad guards, and they're talking about all of the horrible things they have done to the people at Far West. And they did horrible horrible things. I used to think when I was growing up that when they were talking and boasting about it that they hadn't done it, that they were just making up stories. I know now, because I've studied the history more, they actually had done the things they were boasting of. And it's awful. And how does... And so when Abinadi says this, they, whoop, they're not touching him because he starts to glow, right? Mm-hmm. What does Joseph Smith do in Liberty Jail? I love this story. Well, he stands up. He's just... He's in chains, just he's like in a chains. He, He's chained up, he stands up, and he says, Silence, ye fiends of the infernal pit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you and command you to be still. I will not live another minute and hear such language. Cease such talk, or you or I die this minute. That is power. That is power in a moment, just like here. Touch me not. Power in the moment that the people recognize. And how did the guards act at that point to Joseph? Uh. (laughs) Complete silence the rest of the night. I think they apologized briefly and then... Well, complete silence until changing of the guard. Until the changing of the guard. Mm -hmm. And then I love... This is Parley P. Pratt is the one who recorded this story for us. Put it into his journals. He was a great journal keeper. Mm -hmm. And here's what he says about Joseph Smith. So, and, and I want you to read these because this is what I think about Abinadi at this moment. I think the same thing. Here you are. He's standing in front of a king. But which one is more kingly and more Christ-like? Abinadi or King Noah? Joseph Smith or any king or monarch or ruler throughout the world? What does he say? He says, Dignity and majesty have I seen but once, as it stood in chains at midnight, in a dungeon, in an obscure village of Missouri. Okay. You could almost say the same thing about Abinadi. In an obscure village of the Nephites. (laughs) (laughs) Surrounded by Lamanites. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So we're not going to get too much into some of this doctrine. I would love to get into this doctrine with you. I love Abinadi's teaching. 
But he teaches us of the Savior. He teaches us of his life, his works, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. Brenda had some things she wanted to bring out. Yeah, it was very interesting because uh, in verse 7, actually, he talked about how, like, I'm going to finish my message because you have no power to stop me, yeah. for one thing. <laughs> Silence, you fiends of the infernal pit. <laughs> and he talks about how he perceived that it, like, one of his words cut their hearts. Yeah. And it reminded me that the truth, like, it cuts. When we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, when we're not doing what's right, when we know better, the truth cuts. It hurts. When we know we need to improve, but we haven't or haven't been willing to actually put the effort into it, when you hear it, it cuts. Mm -hmm. And I just, that really stood out to me this time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what happens with one high priest? Yeah. Well, when, 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 when Alma does repent, that's true. Yeah. What else? You had some other things in that chapter that stood out to you. There was one other specific thing was the fact that they knew that they wouldn't practice the law of Moses forever. Yeah. And because, like, you see with the Jews in Jerusalem when the Savior comes, they just think they're just going to keep going on with the law of Moses. But the mm -hmm. Nephites here in the Americas, they know that, they're, that there's going to be a time that they won't practice the law of Moses. So how'd they know? If the Jews didn't know, how come the Nephites knew? Very simply, the fact that things were taken out of the Bible. The Nephi and his family, they left early enough when they took the brass plates. They would have had that in there mm -hmm. and probably would have said something about it. Mm -hmm. And even prophets might have had prophecies about it. Probably Lehi and Nephi and Jacob even, yeah. So the fact that we, the Jews in Jerusalem, they had lost scripture their leaders were all hypocrites. Mm -hmm. It's just something that really wouldn't have been taught to them. Yeah. I think the Savior and all of the, again, you had a high priest leader in Jerusalem and all of the council, all supposedly leaders of the church who are hypocrites, not following the gospel. And there they take the Savior and put him to death. Same kind of a situation as what Abinadi is facing. So thank you. Because, yeah, between 600 B.C. and the Savior's birth, 600 years, Somewhere the Jews lost their knowledge that the law of Moses was simply to turn them to the Savior. Everything we're doing, everything that we do, should make us turn to the Savior. Everything. Do we worship Joseph Smith? You hear me talk about him a lot because I think he is so important for us to know. We have to know his words, what he taught. Why? He's the revealer of Christ. Abinadi is a revealer of Christ. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that publisheth peace. And he talks about past prophets, current prophets, future prophets, and of course missionaries and anybody who's sharing the gospel. And then he says, but the real one is the founder, which is Jesus Christ. He is the one we look to, the one we want to become like. And we have wonderful men like Abinadi, Moses, Lehi and Nephi, Joseph Smith, Hiram, to look to as examples of how to become like the Savior. And even here at the end of this, because Abinadi finishes, and he basically says, now whatever you do with me, it doesn't matter. They throw him into prison for how many days? Three. Well, there's a symbolic time. Bring him back out. And why did they, what was his accusation, Brenda? <laughs> <laughs> you brought this out. You loved this so much. Uh... <clears throat> Let me see where... Okay. It's in 17, right? Yeah, in 17, verse 80 says, The accusation against him that they found worthy of death... Death. Death. Was, Thou hast said that God himself shall come down among the children of men. Wait, I missed something there. What? <laughs> <laughs> Is that worthy of death, then? Are you sure? Because they said so. Oh. Well, and they're the leaders. Uh, uh, remember, they're, they're taking a stretch to this one. They're like, uh, how can we get rid of him? Does the leader comes? always know? <laughs> Is the leader always right? No. no. Do we have a responsibility to know for ourselves? You betcha. You betcha. Anything else, Miranda? No. <laughs> and of course, then we get a Alma, and he heads out, and he writes everything Abinadi said. That's the whole reason we know the story. And they do take Abinadi. They do put him to death. And he says, Noah, you're going to die the same way. Many other people will die the same way. And you priests, your children are going to cause it. 
Nothing that he said at that point scared them. They were done. They were so far past feeling that they could not anymore feel that. But it is exactly what happened. Does it just break your heart? This breaks your heart. I'm so glad Alma recorded it so that we have it and we have these beautiful teachings. This doctrine is so deep. As you go through these chapters this week, wow, give it some time. Talk about it and and think about how can I be more like my Savior? How can I be watchful so that I am not deceived, so that I am not led astray? What do we need to change as a family? What do I need to change as an individual? to become the children of Christ. Because those who follow him are his seed. They are his, it talks about generation. It's those who follow him, the children of Christ. Now, Emma is going to tell you the scripture that we want to memorize this week. And then, because this talks about the Savior being risen, we're going to sing what's typically an Easter song. He is risen. Okay, so go ahead, Emma. All right. In chapter 16, verse 9, it says, He is the light and the life of the world. Yea, a light is endless. It cannot, it can never be darkened. Yea, and also a life which is endless, that there can be no more death. Exactly. Okay. So, Catherine, if you'll give us a middle C. Everybody ready? One, two, three, four. He is risen, he is risen, tell it up with joyful voice. He has burst his three days prison, let the whole wide earth rejoice. Death is conquered, man is free, Christ has won. If you've been liking our videos, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and if you want to receive notifications, hit the bell. Also, find and like us on Facebook. We hope to see you next time.